Yeah. So Alex now calls himself part-time consultant. Is that I would say, because I think in barrier management, because he found out that he actually really likes coding. Yeah. Right. Um, started as the product manager for Bota XP in 2009. Uh, so if you have any questions about Bota XP, he might know how it works. Uh, he moved to software developer with product manager as a side role. You started Slice Risk together with Jasper, and then we joined forces. Uh, and you have been working for a period of time as the senior agency data and reporting specialist at Schiphol. Yeah. So uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. 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 So Schiphol, thank you for uh, nurturing him so well. Uh, so now we continue. So you like the essence of things, to challenge things, and uh, I think these are setting the expectations for. Your yeah, she, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Alex. Okay, nice. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I I would try to make a presentation that uh, gives you some, let's say, more conceptual things, uh, some ideas to think about dynamic risk management. I'll explain what it is or what I think it is. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a little bit more of a conceptual presentation where the previous were more like actual projects. It's a little bit more theoretical, but I hope you still like it. Okay, that you can steal stuff from it and use uh, for your own. Uh, so I want to start with uh, how risk management is usually done in a lot of cases. Um, is we assess risks, we uh, fix any outstanding issues, and then we move on. Um, and then the risk assessment that we do um, is. Um, archived um, and then we might report on stuff like L LTIs and, and do uh, th those type of things now if we step back a little bit um, okay let's say there's probably room for improvement here in some way okay this is not the let's say if this was the pinnacle of risk management I would be super depressed right that there's room for improvement um, and so if we take one step back and sort of think about what is risk management, or uh, let's say even what is risk, I agree with uh, Victor, it's probably not a risk matrix, but that's a little bit too simplistic to think about uh, what risk is. Um, so I made this picture, which I think is much nicer, because uh, that's like curvy lines in it. Um, so if you think about risk as a possible, a, a, let's say, distribution of positive outcomes and negative outcomes, right? that you can achieve as, your, as an organization. You want positive outcomes, like either as a product, a service, or a project. And you have all these departments that work together to achieve those positive outcomes. So you've got operations and maintenance and HSC and legal. And if everything goes well, they work together in this like nice dance to produce positive outcomes. Um, so uh, what, where it goes wrong is if you start to stray too far in either direction. So if you if you have like uh, if you take more risk, that, that has like two two possible outcomes. So if you if you start to increase production, for instance, you might create more of your product, but you also increase the the chance perhaps of a negative outcome. Right? If you start to invest in Bitcoin, like there might be like large positive outcomes, <laughs> and then suddenly it's not so positive anymore. Right? So uh, you want and if you're a professional organization, you don't want to rock the boat too much. You want like steady, a steady increase of positive outcomes. Okay. Um, so to avoid these like fluctuations, we introduce uh, barriers, controls to stop this from happening. But even that sometimes goes wrong. They fail, and then we have accidents and we have negative outcomes. I, I think this is like a nice picture. I like this better than having a risk matrix to define what risk is. So okay, you can steal this one. That's one. Uh, then what is uh, management? The, the management part of risk management. So you can think about it like this: like there's a blob of all the stuff you do in your organization, and some of it is super common, and some of it is much more uncommon. So if you if you think of, about like what do we do? We might work at high, do some fueling, and there might be some cybersecurity. I don't know, like if you're if you're a Skipple and a KLM, there might be some airplane landing at some point. Um, 
If you're an, uh, a, a surgeon, you might do some open heart surgery, like partly common, a little, little bit uncommon, right? Because it's a it's a patient, you don't control everything. Um, so part of this is formal risk management. We, we sort of can draw this like nice rectangle in it and do both types risk assessment, identify controls, and that's like our formal system. But then there's all this stuff on the edge, like snow in Texas, who would know? Like what that would do to power plants there. Like, like nobody thought that, that, that there could be that much snow in Texas. So there's this other part that's more informal. That's not covered in your normal risk assessment usually in your formal risk assessment. But we have other stuff there. We have like high reliability organizations, the resilience engineering. These, these types of concepts basically boil down to do people know how to improvise when new stuff comes, comes along, right? Do we know this is how our systems work? We, 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 so we sort of introspect them and then improvise on it in the right way. I'm not going to talk about this part anymore, like the informal part. It's for next week or next year, but we'll do more on this. Like for now, I want to talk a bit more on this, this part of it. That's also what we've been talking mostly about today, right? It's a lot more on the formal side of this matter. Um, so that's sort of risk management part. The, like the, the title was dynamic risk management. So where does the dynamic part come in? Uh, I made this, I have to give, oh no, now I forgot his name. Guy from RSSB. Uh, David Griffin, I have oh, to give David him credit. Yeah. Really smart cookie, a really good guy. He introduced this he, to this graph at a CG network event, so like a gazillion years ago. Uh, this is a cool, I made it into a metro line, if you can tell. Uh, the idea is that you have these two loops. Uh, one loop is about changing your business. And then one loop is about maintaining that business. So if you have, let's say, a nuclear power plant and there's some new type of technology that's developed, that means that there is another, let's say there's a new internal or external driver, depending on where it comes from. If there's new legislation, for instance, that's an external driver that comes into your organization and, and causes you to have like a new change, a requirement for a new change, right? And then you design that change, you implement it, and you verify that the change had the desired effect. Okay. If it doesn't, you have to go back and like, keep changing until it's good. If it's good, then, then you can go into this loop and start maintaining it. So you monitor it. If there's any deviations or stuff that goes wrong, you can say, oh, okay, well, is this like a temporary thing, or, or are we actually degrading our level of control? If it's degrading like, uh, more, at a more fundamental level, let's say, then you can go back into your change loop and do management of change. Essentially, it's management of change com combining it with your normal operations. I like this picture because it, it's like uh, combining the two worlds a little bit together. Oh, uh, this presentation. Whoops. Let's go back. Hello. Uh, I'm going to talk mainly about this monitor bit and this verify that the change had the desired effect, which are two sides of the same coin. Um, so the challenge that we have is that do we know how the level of risk changes over time? So as we sort of are in our organization over time, risk goes up, goes down, do we, do we actually know what the risk level is in response to a change we made or in our effort to maintain the same level of risk? So, like, how do we do that? Like, what are options like, to think of? One thing, oh, yes, okay. One thing is to measure accidents. Oh no, it's really not happy with like playing eight different moves at the same time. <laughs> I guess Harold of Free Enterprise, like, so there's the classics in a way, like uh, Challenger so in Spain. That's all van der Rijn, perhaps the UK people don't know this. <laughs> they, they tried to lift a bridge on floating. It didn't go really well. No one died. A dog. A dog. A dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah, don't forget to do that. Not to do the um, so the problem with these is that they don't happen too often, which is good. But it's not good for us to know 
uh, what the level of risk is. So even with uh, less severe incidents than this, that the trend is all, in, in most cases it goes down, right? We have less and less accidents uh, as we move along. Um, and so, uh, yeah, more safety means less data in this sense for, for measuring accidents. Apparently I'm not allowed to say accidents anymore, I don't know why, like I think I still think it's a good term. But, um, more safety means less data, so yeah, we're sort of, uh, it's good, but for monitoring it's, it's not so good, like it's not a, a viable option. So what could we do? Okay, we could think like we want to do near misses, so where, where it's, it's still an incident, something happens, but it doesn't like completely go wrong. Uh, so this is like in the ransomware uh, bow tie, a little ransom. I, I made this up. It's not a real bow tie. So you do like uh, some threads would be like credential stuffing. So if you reuse your password, does anybody reuse their password? No. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Yes. Oh. Everyone does. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Because so this is credential stuffing. This is the actual term for it. If, you're, if one site gets hacked, they get your password, they will just use it to try every other site that they want to get into to see if you may have reused your password. So, you know, like a barrier would be to use a password manager. Yeah, of course. Nobody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. So, uh, two factor authentication, right? You have to put in the code along with your password, like, like that, those types of things you would do to make sure that credential stuffing doesn't work. You get phishing emails, so they, that you actually give them your uh, your email, username, password. Now the problem with, uh, let's say we, we start to measure how many phishing emails we get, right? That's a near miss. Um, that's nice, because, but it doesn't give us everything we want. Because it doesn't tell us whether our off-site data backups are working. So near misses will only, only get you a bit, uh, let's say, part of the way. And they still suffer from some other issues. So uh, we only get partial information about our risks, right? Usually only the, the left-hand side of a bow tie, if you want to think in bow tie terms. Um, and things still have to go wrong to make sure you're doing things right. You're still waiting around for stuff to go wrong. Uh, the other <coughs> problem with it, it is relies heavily on people usually reporting stuff to you. So for instance, in the phishing email thing, you're trying to get people to report phishing emails to you to monitor as a near miss. So it really requires everybody in the organization or to know what they have to report, and that just becomes a hassle. Um, as you become safer and safer, the, the stuff that they have to report becomes more less and less related to the actual end event you're trying to prevent, right? So it becomes increasingly more difficult for people to figure out what they have to report. <coughs> so also not great. Option three. Uh, is to measure control performance directly. So we're not going to wait around for incidents to happen. We are going to look directly at all of these barriers and sort of trying to make sure that they're okay. Um, that's good. In some ways, it's, it also has some downsides. So uh, it's good because we don't need to wait for an incident. We can start doing this right away. It's way more relatable. Uh, because the, the barriers and the controls are what people are actually doing, right? So, like using password managers. Um, the downside is that if your bow tie, for instance, is, does not include the right scenarios or the right barriers, you will not, never know. The incidents are the only thing that will tell you that you've been looking at the wrong thing. Like monitoring barrier performance, as, as this is what this is going towards, will not tell you that you're looking at the wrong thing, right? So that's sort of the downside of this. Uh, the barriers are really like a proxy to the risk. So if we want to measure barrier performance, it's sort of like, in, at, in the end, monitoring accidents is the, the most direct thing that you can do to monitor the risk, right? Because that's actually what you're trying to prevent. The barriers are like a proxy. Okay, so um, let's dive a little bit more into this control performance thing. Like, what are some options that we can think of to, um, to monitor control performance? I would say there's like three big buckets that we can pick from. So we either have uh, some type of self-verification, where the control owner, the person doing it, they, ver they sort of 
report their the performance. There's some type of other verification, whether that's like an internal audit team or some external auditor that comes in and verifies it. Or there's some type of automated verification. And those three things all have like their pros and cons. Like self-verification, for instance, super good. Like I think one of the main benefits is that the control owners are sort of reminded of what's important. Because they have to start like reporting like, yeah, this is still going okay, yeah, this is still going okay. And so it's sort of a reminder for them as well on like what are all the things that are important. It's really low effort to set up as well. It's sort of, I mean, relatively low effort, okay, compared to some of the other stuff. Uh, it's the, the downside is that it's very vulnerable if your incentives are wrong. So, for instance, if somebody, a control owner, has to report like this, my control is not doing very well, and then you sort of <laughs> slap them in the face for it, like that will not work, right? So that's a very quick way to kill your reporting. Um, so you have to sort of make sure that the incentives are right here. Also, for instance, if people are too proud of how they run their operation, they might be, like it might be, like there's very, several reasons why somebody might under-report a, a control performance, right? So it's sort of vulnerable in, in that sense. The other downside is that it's high effort in operations to, um, so you you're keep asking people to fill this in, right? So there's some effort in here. Um, the other verification, I think, like some person checking controls, is good for things that don't have a clear focus or ownership. So every, basically all the leftover bits that nobody really looks at. The other verification is good for that type of stuff. Right. So the, the critical controls you would basically would be here. And then the non-critical controls would still have to be checked occasionally. Right, but that would, you would do more with this other. Um, okay. The automated verification uh, is, is where you would have some type of calculation, where you take some data, you calculate the uh, control performance automatically. It's objective, so that's good. It doesn't suffer from this thing where your incentives are wrong and then somebody starts underreporting. So it's more objective, that's good. It's low effort once you've set it up. That's also good. Like, this automated stuff tends to just work once you've set it up. Uh, the biggest downside is that it's high effort to set up and it's slow to change. So you have to like connect to it, like find a database, get the data out, like talk to your IDT department to open up some ports. Like there's all this uh, technical stuff that you have to go through to set it up. And then once you figure out like, oh no wait, we have to find this, it's really not the right data source. Like changing it is a, is a pain in the ass. So that's sort of the upsides and the downsides of this part. And there's some other stuff that uh, you can read on the slide later. Um, so yeah, we have these three rough options, right? Uh, and then there's different types of, let's say we, we ask somebody to self-verify this, this control. We want to give them some supporting information, perhaps, that they can base their decision on as to how good this control is performing. So you can think of like, okay, we'll give them all the observations that the, and actions that have happened, any audit information. Perhaps there is some database that they can all, that can support this decision as to how good this is actually performing. Same thing for this other verification. And of course, the automated verification also needs some data to base this verification on. Like, for these two, it's optional. We could sort of just give this, like, use password manager, give it to the, the control owner, the, the person responsible for it, and just ask, like, what do you think? Like, is it going okay? And then, optionally, we can give him extra information that supports, that informs his decision. For the automated verification, we need some type of data, right? We need it because there's some type of calculation that happens to, to determine the performance. Um, if you start going down this road, I would say keep it simple. Like this morning there was one comment, like how would you do it if you had both? You want to sort of automatically calculate the performance if you have both audit data and your incidents. And I would say don't go down that road. Like that will explode in complexity very quickly. Um, so for instance, you have to think about stuff like, okay, what if my audit data tells me something different, it tells me it's really good, then I have all the incident data that tells me it's really bad. Like, 
do I trust the instance? Do I trust the audits? Like suddenly, you understand? Like you know, it, it's sort of exploding complexity. So I would say start off picking one source and just doing a simpler calculation. Okay. So these are our options. One, we measure accidents, we measure near misses, we measure control performance either with self-verification, other verification, or automated verification. I think at a high level, this is like your a la carte menu. <coughs> if people come up with different things to add to this list, I will, I will hear about it with, at the drinks. I'm curious about your insights. This is my a la carte menu for, for picking from. Uh, so when would I apply different, different, these different options? So option one and two, I've just been talking about how limited they are. Like if you have a subject that still happens a lot, like we have bird strikes, it's a skip or we have slips, strips and falls in some other organization. So that happens often enough that you can still use incidents, accidents as, as valid information, right? So high probability, low severity usually. If you have like high probability, high severity, you're probably out of business. So like by definition, it's always high probability, low severity. Um, so you can still use that option one and two in those cases, right? For those types of hazards. Uh, the self-verification. I would apply those mostly if you have like a low probability, high severity, dynamic, highly behavioral open systems. So like uh, a lot of people that have to do all kinds of things, it's not a very technical environment, like there's people running around. It's a, it's a surgery or it's like a, a lifting operation where there's a lot, of, a lot of people that have to do things. In those cases, use a lot of self-verification. Some other verification perhaps. In the other, another case, you might have a low probability, high severity risk that is strict and highly technical. So you have a, a running a power plant or launching a, a SpaceX rocket. And so those are, that's a different type of operation. That's very technical and, and strict. There's not, not a lot of room for error. And so in those cases, you could rely more on this type of automated verification. So really depending on the subject, you would pick from this a la carte menu what the right strategy would be. Okay. Most will be a mix, right? So I just gave you like a extreme, exo extreme cases. Most will be a mix where you would do like some self-verification, you would pick some automated verification using the Jasper's matrix of like, is it worth the effort and the, how easy it is to get. Um, you would use sort of <coughs> near-miss information to sort of say like, what are the, the more, more uh, severe threats, for instance. Uh, for most hazards, what would be the best approach? I would say sort of just focus on control management, management because that will work for any hazard. Right? So the incidents and the near misses will only work for stuff that you haven't driven down to a low enough, uh, to, to, to a low, let's say, frequency. So I, I would say your default approach, control management, that, that just, it works across the board. Uh, it's self-verification I would do mostly because it's low effort to set up. And it, it has this added benefit that it focuses the control owners on the stuff they have to do, right? So self-verification has this really nice benefit. And you just have to be careful about like the incentives that you have, like that people are comfortable reporting that something is broken. Um, so some automated verification is good if it's worth the effort and it's simple enough to set up. Uh, this other verification where you have like audit teams or, or uh, external auditors, it's nice as an additional layer of the, if there's no clear owner. It's nice as a, like a, like a Besenwagen, is that like a, I don't know, like the sweeping truck. <laughs> like the, sweeping up the leftovers at the end. But I, I would say that, that that would be my baseline at least to use this as a, as a sweeping Besenwagen. Um, so don't use incidents to monitor performance unless you have a lot of them. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, you can use incidents and near misses to uncover missing scenarios. That's important. You still want to you want to think about them because the barrier management thing will not tell you that you've been looking at the wrong scenario, that you've missed a scenario, or that there's barriers you you have not been looking at. Uh, and they can you, they, you can use them to verify the assumptions that you have about control effectiveness. 
right? So in your bow tie, you make this assumption essentially, like this barrier will have an effect on this scenario. Now, if that scenario never happens, you will never know for sure how effective that control is, right? So if an incident happens, it's a it's a nice real life audit of your bow tie. Bow. So. I would say like in dynamic risk management, if this is the if this is the best approach for most hazards, right? So we do this control management thing. In dynamic risk management, I would say that we should then rely less on the risk matrix because we can never get to it. We cannot reliably estimate what the risk level is. Right? Incidents and incidents and accidents will be the only thing that will really tell you what your risk level is. Everything else is just making up numbers and guessing. Right, so we cannot, we have to rely less on this risk matrix and instead look at the level of control. So, I mean, this is just like, a, like the, the uh, controls and then what the performance is for each control in the stack bar chart, my favorite type of chart. Um, so it's more like a patchwork where we sort of have this nice patchwork of controls and their performance and, and it would be less like a calculation. And so perhaps even like the question we were asking in the beginning is the wrong question. So the question in the beginning was to know how the level of uh, risk changes over time, but perhaps the question should be how, how the level of control changes over time. And I, I don't think, so perhaps everybody in this room is the exception, but in most organizations that's not the case. Like managers will want to see like how, where, how does the risk matrix change? And, and that's just a, like an almost unknowable thing in a lot of cases. And so, uh, I don't know, like, like, like uh, once we, we are convinced that this is actually the right question to ask, the next uh, challenge perhaps becomes to how do we convince the rest of the organization that that is also a good idea. Um, but at least, uh, this is my pitch. I think this is the right question to ask, like, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, oh, that was already it, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Or not, and we can have drinks. <laughs> or challenges. Challenges? Yeah. As would you like it? Yeah. So I have an option for. Yeah. And that's activation to mandate. So my barriers, so, I, so I've got, I, I see different categories of barriers. So I've actually got eliminate barriers that try and stop the <coughs> normal business, stuff we do day in, day out. Yeah. And but then if I get prevention barriers and one of those activates, that means actually our eliminate barriers fail to do what yeah. they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So I can then take, actually, because that alarm was activated, I know my eliminate juice. barriers have actually failed. That's true. Yeah. And then I've got more demand <coughs> sort of data that actually if I've got an alarm followed by a trip and the trip activates, actually I know my alarm failed too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because it never changed the direction of the causation. Yeah. Doesn't work well on the right hand side because still sort of a type of yeah, yeah. Yeah? yeah. So you know, if I know we've just pushed our emergency button and my fire system has just activated, actually I've gone a long way down the path. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But then I can say everything to it's the failed. left yeah. has actually failed. Yeah. yeah. I like that. that that's uh, smart. Yeah. To deduce that based on. But that. what you need to understand is the relationships between the barriers and where do they actually activate? Yeah. What are they trying to do for us? Yeah. And in some cases, it's not that easy, right? So in some cases, the barriers are in parallel. Even though in, in both types, lo it looks like they're linear, but in reality, they're linear. But, but in, I do think we've got this stark thing around, I've actually got barriers that live on the left-hand side of the threat. Yeah. That are trying to stop the threat from occurring in the first place. Yeah. And then I've got the barriers that live in between, truly live in between the blue box and the center. Yeah. And are trying to stop us getting to the top of it. Uh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. smart. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll give you that <laughs> option four. <laughs> Any other uh, questions, challenges, stuff that was unclear? I didn't record how many times he said stuff. I and that's usually my yeah. stop word. Yeah. Good stuff. My girlfriend said I said I say so a lot. <laughs> so you probably so did. So 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 okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Cheers. Thank you.